Chapter 7 Home from the Sea The next day the storm had passed and the crew was able to set sail again. They were past Bermuda now and finally approaching land. Every day Felix saw other vessels sailing in the area. He swelled with pride when a British naval ship, the Ark Royal, cruised by and saluted the tiny Mayflower too. Cruise liners and American Navy ships sailed up to take a closer look at this rare craft making its way across the ocean. Felix heard they were getting close to shore now. The sea had changed from a deep clear blue to a sort of green. The second mate, Mr. Small, said they were on soundings. Mr. Small explains that on soundings meant that the water was getting shallow enough to measure the depth to the bottom with a long line. This line had a lead weight attached to help it sink. Felix was tempted to take a swipe at the line as the crewman swung it out over the side, but he didn't want to end up in the water as the lead weight sank to the bottom. The whole crew eagerly anticipated sighting land. They had been at sea for almost six weeks, and even the hardiest of sailors was ready to set foot on shore again. Felix came aboard as such a young kitten, knew only, May knew only Mayflower too as his home. At first he missed his family, but now he wasn't so eager to get ashore. He had grown to love the motion of the ship, the companionship of his 33 crewmates, and the fresh sea air. Felix didn't want, didn't know what would become of him when the ship finally arrived in Plymouth and all of the crew scattered back to their homes. Felix's worries were soon forgotten when he heard some, when he heard one sailor sing out, Land ho! I see Cape Cod dead ahead! The entire crew was on deck now. They climbed the rigging to get a better view of the land rising up out of the sea. Felix scampered up to the forecastle deck. Scotty Bell scooped him up and held him high so that he could see the land. That's right, Felix. It's off that way, Scotty said, pointing Felix in the right direction. Don't you worry about a thing, little fellow. I'll look out. I'll look after you on shore. There are a lot of people where you are headed. You aren't used to so much attention. I'll make sure you're part of the festivities. Felix felt better with Scotty's words, but he still wished he had a home to go to when the ship reached Plymouth. Felix never imagined the kind of reception the ship and his crew would receive. First in Provincetown, Massachusetts, then the next day in Plymouth, thousands of people cheered and waved. Everyone was eager to see the crewmen and the old-fashioned ship that brought them safely to America. A crew in a shallop, like the kind the original Mayflower carried, rowed up to the ship in Plymouth Harbor and brought the men ashore. Graham told Felix to stay aboard for now. Felix might get lost among all the people and activities in town. Staying on board the ship seemed like a good idea to Felix. He knew he would have to leave the ship soon enough. He wanted to spend some time alone remembering the voyage and all the things he had learned along the way. Ashore, there were television cameras, newspaper reporters, and important people making speeches and shaking hands. Thousands of spectators lined the shore and a grassy hill trying to find the best view of all the festivities. Felix could hear the voices carrying over from over the still waters of Plymouth Harbor. He felt the warm June sunshine beat down on the deck. The ship, finally at rest after 55 days at sea, would be Felix's home for only a few more weeks. After staying in Plymouth for two weeks, Mayflower II traveled to Newport, Rhode Island, and then on to New York City. Felix did get ashore in Plymouth but liked the familiar surroundings of the ship better. In New York City, all the crewmen marched in a ticker tape parade down Fifth Avenue. True to his word, Andrew Anderson Bell, better known to his crewmates as Scotty, carried Felix in the parade. 
After New York, most of the crew had to go back to England. Graham packed up his sea bag and talked with Joe in their cabin. Well, my friend, I'm off in two days. Captain Villiers has arranged for me to fly home. I'll never forget you, Joe. I'm glad we sailed together, Graham. I don't think I could would have I could have managed without someone my age on the ship. Have you made any plans for Felix here? Joe said, patting the cat. Well, you know I can't bring him on the plane. I hear the ship will be going to Florida this winter, and the people at Plymouth can't take him. How about you, Joe? Do you have any room at home for Felix? I have a big dog and two birds at home, Graham. But I know someone who might like to take him, Joe said. Let's get a ride to my house in Waltham. A girl down the street from my house loves animals, and she might make a home for him. Two days later, Felix found himself in Anne Berry's house in Waltham. Anne, a young woman Joe's age, was happy to have Joe back in town after his big sea adventure. Felix moved right into her home. They set up a bed for him using a bunk mattress from the ship. It took the seagoing cat some time to adjust to a quiet life on land, but he grew to like the soft grass of the backyard and the warm house that didn't heal over in a storm. Besides, Joe came by often to visit him and tell Anne stories of how they sailed Mayflower 2 to America. <laughs>